All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And over the last month and a half, we have been diving in like crazy with that. We have been to Indonesia, to East Africa, the Arctic, Panama, and more, all featuring incredible stories of conservation from across the globe. So thank you so, so much to all our teachers and families for continuing to tune in live on camera and on YouTube over the last month and a bit. It's been really exciting having you all. Today, Today's presentation is a little bit special for me. So we were originally slated to talk about caribou today. We've switched that up a little. We're going to deal with bison at the Toronto Zoo. Now, over the last few months, we have done 25 plus programs with the Toronto Zoo, all our most popular programs we've ever done. It is so exciting to get to share with you all the amazing animals in my home city of Toronto um, with such an amazing institution with some amazing education staff. So thank you guys for tuning in for this. And I can't wait to get started. Speaking of getting started, what I'm going to do to kick off is share a special message from the Toronto Zoo CEO, Dolph de Jong. Uh, so let me bring that up for you guys, and then we will dive in with our education staff. So thanks uh, for waiting. Give me two quick seconds here, and we will share this. Let's do it. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Toronto Zoo and University of Toronto Scarborough Lecture Series. Today, we've got some amazing experts going to speak to you about these incredible creatures right here, wood bison. Now, they're massive animals but they're animals that are in a lot of trouble. And our experts have been doing phenomenal work, learning more about them, learning more about the reproductive physiology, and learning about the steps we can take to help protect these animals now and their populations for future generations. So we're really excited about the speakers we have for you today. We're also really excited about the upcoming programs we have. We have two more lectures planned in the upcoming year. We think you're really gonna enjoy them, and we really think you're gonna enjoy what we have for you today. So with that, thank you very much for joining us here at your Toronto Zoo, and we hope you enjoy the program. Fantastic. Thanks so much to Dolph for uh, sharing that message with us. And for our students, if you guys want to check out the first program series of the Toronto Zoo and University of Toronto together, check out our Lemur Day program. We had five lemur programs in one day. It was a really incredible celebration of a really unique animal and ecosystem. So I'd encourage you to check that out on our YouTube page. So now that Dolph shared his uh, opening message, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ellen and the team at the Toronto Zoo to take us into the bison enclosure directly. How exciting is that? Mary Ellen and guys, go for it. Thank Thank you so much for joining today. Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Toronto Zoo. I am Ken, one of the bison keepers. You can see behind here we have 18 female wood bison here. They're all captive born here. Uh, they, for over the many years, over the last 30 years, wood bison become extinct through in the wild because of man, predators, and diseases. So here at the Toronto Zoo, we've been doing uh, a research problem, for a, a, a area for the longest year now. We get all these young animals in here. So what we have here is these are all, all these are cows. So we do have uh, bulls here too, but they're in a, another area right now. So what we have here is these cows are all ranging anywhere from four years of age to 19 years of age. So some of them are going through our breeding program. So here we're trying to make a healthy, healthy collection of cow, uh, babies here from our herd here. So you can just see right now, I have just fed the animals now. We're, ha we're, st we're still a wild animal, we have to be careful. So now they're happy they've had some food right now. So you can just see like they're all got their nice winter coats right now. They're all built for winter right now. Being Canadian animals, they don't like do they don't like the summer months. But you can see that they got nice coats. Uh, you can see right now, like I say, they're all cows. Our bulls are in another paddock right now. So what we do is we have a chute system down in there, and that's where all our cows are processed. We keep an eye on them, and every fall we do a repo, uh, do a catch up, and we do a reproductive study on them. And that way we were able to um, uh, use our cows. We're trying to utilize from other, uh, Saskatoon is a big program. And that's what we usually do. So anyways, I'm gambling. I'm getting into my, what I know, but we'll pass it on to Gabby here. She's the pro at this. Hi, Jesse and everyone. And welcome to the bison herd at Toronto Zoo. And these are uh, an amazing group of animals, not only are they iconic Canadian? And as Ken said, they, they love the winter months, great hardy animals. And uh, we, we not only love to have them here, but they're really an important part of our research and conservation. Toronto Zoo has been involved in wood bison conservation since the 1980s, when we actually reintroduced animals back in the wild. But in order to reintroduce animals, 
you've got to have babies. And uh, that's one of my areas. Uh, so actually, Jesse, I'm going to pass it to you to put up some slides for me. Fantastic. I'll get those up for everyone and give me two quick seconds and we'll have those on screen and you can talk over them. Just tell me when we need to switch between everything and we're all set. Go for it. Perfect. So um, my name is Gabby Mastromonaco and I'm actually the manager of reproductive sciences here at the zoo. What that means is that I'm a reproductive biologist. I love learning about reproduction in different species, but today we're really going to focus on the bison. And one of the things we're gonna talk about is not only reproduction, but stress, gotta love it. I'm feeling some of that right now. So let's see how we pull this off. This, if you look it up in the, in the, the photo up in the right hand corner, that's what bison used to be all over North America. You could see in the map, in the, in the yellowy green color, that was their historical range. And unfortunately, for what many reasons, uh, most of it human related and whether it was hunting, um, habitat um, infringement, and very sadly, currently disease. These are all reasons that we, we decimated the bison herds in the wild. And you can see the tiny little dots. That's really all that's left of them. So in partnership with many of our collaborators, everywhere from Parks Canada, other academic folks, University of Saskatchewan, we're trying to figure out this problem and we're trying to, to improve the, the genetics and the long-term sustainability of bison in the wild. So next slide, Jesse. So what, what is it about stress? Stress, you know what? It's part of our daily lives. If you can click forward another one, some of it has to happen. You can see in the top, the males in breeding season, it's actually called rut or rut behavior. You know what? They actually want that kind of stress. It's part of natural breeding processes. So, so there are some good stresses out there in the wild, but then you could see in the bottom, that's not so good stress. So predation and of course, um, hunting other human behaviors that impact the bison, that is not good stress. So whereas we need to have a little bit of stress, too much of it is not good. And it all relates back to reproduction. When you have too much stress and it's really chronic, then sometimes we don't have the reproductive success that we're hoping for. So other things impact reproduction, not just stress. And you could see them spelled out in the slide there. Environment, nutrition, health, genetics, behavior. And with bison, it's really specific. It's, it's their genetic variability. We took, we took the herds in the wild to a small number, so they're not as genetically diverse as we would have hoped. And of course, there's a lot of disease in the wild herds. So we're trying to, to help them overcome those two challenges. Next slide, please. And that's where kind of I come in and my department comes in. We prefer all animals to breed naturally at the zoo and everywhere. But sometimes for, for whatever reason, we might need to actually help them out a little bit. And that's called assisted reproduction. And we could do different things. We can work with the males, females, or both of them. Um, the techniques are listed there, artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, embryo transfer, same techniques as you would do with your cows and pigs and other species. Um, but we focus on bison. The most important thing as the photographs show is that we're able to take their genetic material as sperm and embryos and actually freeze it. Those tiny little straws you see are straws of frozen sperm from one of our bulls. And we can keep it in our tanks forever. The liquid nitrogen is 196 degrees below zero and the samples can stay there in perpetuity. Next slide, please. And so here you could see, uh, well, you could see the real bison herd, but I put a photograph anyways. And this is where I, I lead into what the work that our keeping staff is doing. So our animal care staff is amazing at training animals. So they work these bison year round to keep their stress levels down. And you could see that we train them to, to go through a corral system so that we can work with them for assisted reproduction purposes. Training, lowering stress levels is the most important thing we could do to make the reproductive research a success. Next slide. And you could see us here, this was just a couple of uh, months ago in October when we um, build like a, a little um, home for us out here in, in the back of the zoo and we were thawing embryos that have been produced by taking sperm and eggs and mixing them in the lab. 
and transferring them back into our females. It took us almost all day to do the uh, 15 of the 18 females. And, um, and next slide, you can see some years, the little photographs on the right, that's the ultrasound on day 35. Uh, of the little fetuses from the, the pregnant bison females and, of course, the calves that were born from that. One of the spectacular things in 2015, we had a bull, uh, we had a calf that was born from sperm that had been frozen for 35 years. That is the longest frozen sample on record for a wildlife species. And all the calves born at the Toronto Zoo since 2009 are either are, are from assisted reproduction, either insemination or embryo transfer. Small steps forward towards the bigger plan of helping the species in the wild. That's it for me, Jesse. Well, thank you so, so much. How cool is that? Um, cool, Mary Ellen and team, is there anything more we're gonna share uh, with Bison before we head to Rudy? No, I think we're all set, Jesse. We'll keep on the buys in here to make sure we uh, keep them in the view, but we can head on over to Re uh, Rudy to talk a little bit more about environmental stressors. Fantastic. Rudy, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, take us away. Okay, so I work on stress, but I'm an ecologist. I work in the natural world um, and I try to understand what goes on when animals are exposed to each other, to weather, and especially to predators. And we're one of the predators. So uh, for the bison work that I'm doing, it's actually a collaboration. The team leader is a guy called Tom Jung. He's a senior wildlife biologist in the Yukon. So that's about 6,000 kilometers away. It's at the other end of the country near Alaska. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of a story of what happened there. Um, the, the, the wood bison were exterminated. They went extinct about 350 years ago. We know that they were there uh, 800 years ago from the fossil record, but about 350 years ago, in all likelihood, we uh, drove them to extinction. And then uh, as part of sort of the natural rewilding of areas, the Yukon government decided to put uh, snowshoe, uh, uh, I'm gonna say snowshoe hares, which is the other species I work on, but I mean, uh, uh, wood bison back into the wild. So in 1988 to about 1993, they introduced 170 wood bison into an area uh, west of Whitehorse called Klawani. And uh, those populations just blew up. They grew up, they grew really fast. And uh, by 19, 2014, we, uh, there was almost 1,500 animals there. Uh, they were growing very fast. And um, Hunting, the Yukon government allowed hunting from 1997 onwards, but the hunting hasn't delayed their population growth. So they're still growing uh, rapidly. The Yukon government is exp expending a lot of money to understand them. They're putting radio collars on them. They're doing census work. How many are there? They're looking at things like reproduction, etc. And so they're following them very closely. Uh, how I got involved was because of my work on stress. And Tom Jung asked a very simple question. If you hunt um, uh, bison, wood bison, uh, do, are the animals stressed? And if, you, if there are areas which are less hunted and more hunted, are the animals in more hunted areas more stressed? So this is one of the environmental factors. <clears throat> and so he contacted me and one of my people, Dr. Phoebe Edwards, did the fecal analysis and Curtis Bosson uh, did the initial sample preparation. But what, what Tom Young collected for us was their poo, their feces. And the, the stress signature comes through the feces. So it's a really nice way to, to sort of analyze and ask that simple question. Are hunted um, um, bison more stressed than less hunted ones? So he collected in two different years, 2018, just a couple of years ago, and 2019. And so we did the analysis on the stress signature from the feces, and a lab in Manitoba did the work on the nutrients. But the bottom line is that when we looked at the stress from these two different populations, one that was heavily hunted and one that was much less hunted, there wasn't a dramatic difference in stress. Um, the stress signature that we expected to see, that we uh, hypothesized, wasn't there. Um, 
the two years were very different. 2018 had very heavy snow in the southern Yukon. 2019 did not. And uh, as uh, Tom Young explains, in 2018, the hunters on skidoos and so on could get near the buffalo, the, the bison, but in 2019, they were not heavily hunted. So the, the explanation for the similarity, irrespective of hunting within a year, is probably that the scale that we were working on was too uh, small. In other words, um, they experienced stress at a much uh, a larger level than we thought that they would. So they're saying a very similar stress profile within a year, whether they were heavily hunted or not. But that basically says that the bison know what's going on, even if they're um, even if some of them are not being shot. And so that's really interesting. But that's where we are right now. Um, we're in the preliminary stages of this analysis. We're hoping to publish it in a scientific journal. And I think it'll be really important. So back over to you, Jesse. Thank you so much, Rudy. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, again, getting the chance to see bison live, hear from what their care is all about, and hear about some of the, the amazing research being done on them in the field is always a tremendous opportunity. So thank you guys so, so much for this. Uh, I want to note for all our classes, too, uh, Banff National Park, we've done a whole series of programs with them over the last few uh, years, actually. If you want to see some bison live in the field, hear about some of the reintroduction taking place. Uh, you can check all that out on our YouTube page. This has been awesome, guys. All right, with that said, let's dive in with questions. We've got a whole bunch of students tuning in from across Canada, across the U.S. on YouTube. If you're on YouTube with us, uh, do let me know where you're joining from. We've got groups in Miami, across Ontario, and beyond, so thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, and our live classes, I'll be coming to you guys in just a minute for a question. Mary Ellen, uh, if you want to demute, are you guys good to go for questions? Yep, we are all set. I will just remind you, our audio is a little bit off. So if you we don't get an answer from us right away, if you could write it in the chat, we yes. can uh, speak it back to you. Will do. So if I if you can't hear me, I'll put it in a banner that comes up on the screen for everyone. But let's go to Ms. Gill's class first. They're joining us, grade ones in uh, Ontario, in the Hani way. Uh, so Ms. Gill, just demute your microphone and come on in. Oh. Here, here you go. Okay, Great. grade one, do you have so... Katai, yes, what is your question, Katai? He's going to ask. Okay. Unmute. <laughs> the fun of video broadcast. Unmute. Unmute, Katai. Yes. What is the animal name? Oh. Okay. Oh, we can ask that. What are the animals' names? Do the bison all have names, Jenny, guys? We have Paula. Sorry. We have Jenny. We have Paula. Uh, we have, let me see, we have Boo. Uh, let me see. Now you got me a thing. Um, uh, Amy. Amy. Uh, Jenny. There's 18 of them. Um, we can't yeah, remember I them know. all. Can't name them all. <laughs> That's a pretty good start. Yeah. There was Dasher and Dancer and Prancer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's fantastic, guys. Hey, I, I love that they're all named. And something that's been really fun for us in all our zoo programs is hearing all the cool animal names. The Toronto Zoo has some of the best animal names in the world. So check back on some of our other broadcasts. Thanks, guys, for, for trying with that. Thanks for our question from Nani Way. All right, Miss Gail, joining us at Charbot Lake. Uh, if you have a question, just demute your mic. Come on in. Go for it. Hi, my students want to know how many calves does the average bison have? Did you guys catch that? Sorry, we didn't quite hear that one. Oh, Miss Gail, can you repeat it for us? Oh. Yeah, all our teachers can keep their mics unmuted. It'll help when we do Q&A. Miss Gail, do you want to repeat the question for us? Sorry. Sure. Okay, sorry. Um, so my students wanted to know, um, how many calves does the average bison have? Yeah, how many calves do they have, guys? Well. You know what, the, the mums are pregnant for about nine, nine and a half months, just under 10 months. So they will have one calf every two years or so. So every female here at the zoo can have, you know, maybe five, six calves, perhaps yeah. in the wild a little bit less, but around that. Yeah, great question, guys. All right, Miss Reynolds class in Toronto, just give me your mic again and uh, come on in. Welcome in. Hi, guys. How many years do they live for? Yeah, nice question. How long do they live, guys? Uh, bison have known to live up into their uh, mid-20s. I've worked with a bison female. It was 24. 
Uh, but a- averagely, that's in captivity, so they're looked after more. Probably in the wild, they live maybe between 15 and 18 years of age, and then they was a predator or, or some injury would take them out. But they live longer in captivity because we look after them long better. And I'd say about 22 to 24 is a captive age. Yeah. So not only is that a great answer individually for bison, but I love this idea of them living longer in captivity. I think a lot of people assume uh, things about animals in wild versus captivity. So Mary Ellen, if you could speak a little bit to uh, CAZA certification and what that means for keeping animals uh, sort of as healthy and happy as possible in zoos, that would be awesome. Yeah, for sure. So just like Jesse has mentioned in a lot of our other broadcasts, we get this question a lot about how old our animals are and how long they can live for. And we always like to point out that here at the Toronto Zoo, we are monitoring them carefully um, and we are able to provide them with all their nutrition that they do need here. And we try and give it to them in the most um, uh, interesting ways possible, enrichment wise, to make sure that their lives are still uh, as natural as they can be. Uh, but we also have state of the art health centers here at the Toronto Zoo uh, with an amazing team of vet staff and uh, also uh, staff like Gabby here as well, who is part of our reproductive team. Um, and they work day in and day out to make sure that our animals, along with our keepers like Ken here as well, uh, that our animals have the best life possible here. So with all of that care that they're getting around them and all that monitoring, we're able to try and be as proactive as possible with any injuries or illness that come about with them. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And Gabby and Ken, you guys rock. Not only are you taking care of the bison, but you guys are great presenters, so I appreciate it so, so much. All right, uh, let's do our other live classes, and then we'll take some from YouTube. We've got some new groups joining us for the first time today, like Mrs. Soroyu's class. Uh, welcome into you guys as well. But Miss Church, come on in for now, and let's uh, take a question from your group, Rainbow Elementary. Hi there. So a couple of questions we have. Um, what, what and how much would they eat in a day? How and how there? many are left in the uh, world? Uh, wait, wait. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I heard the first part of that question. How much do they eat in the day? Uh, no, the, second is, the second is how many are left in the world? How many bison are there? There's probably about uh, no more than about 5,000 left in the wild now. We were many, many more like in back in the early 1900s and early 2000s. There was thousands, but because of disease and everything, took them out. So there's probably no more than about 5,000 pure wood bison throughout the uh, provinces. Uh, they're little widespread little areas are not all together now. And that's what's so important about our breeding program, that if we get a more and more young animals here, we might be able to do another re- release program down the road. And then how much do they eat in well, a day? How much do they eat right now? The, our bison right now, 18 cows. We're feeding five bales of hay and five bags of grain and they all get an equal share. Uh, we find that right now there's an abundance of food left right now. So if, they're, if they need more, they'll tell us and we'll increase it. But through the winter months, they burn off more energy. They need more food. So whatever they want, we'll give it to them. So we, that range of food can go up all the time. Yeah. Thanks, and Great job, guys. All right, we're going to head to no more to Calgary for the Better Naps class. They're a lot closer to some of our bison than our Ontario class today. So Better Naps, come on in. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, my question is, oh, guys. <laughs> what are the predators of prey? Yeah, what are the predators of prey, guys? What are their predator and prey? Yeah. Okay, perfect. What are their predators out in the wild? Usually wolves, um, man, like I say, man is a, it can be a predator too, but it's usually wolves that will go after in packs that will take out single cows and a calf. Uh, bulls being that they'll weigh a lot more, more of a challenge. But if wolves, a pack of wolves can take down a cow, that's what they'll do. And that's probably one of their main, main first of all, in, um, um, animal predators that they have. So. Yeah. Awesome, guys. All right. Let's yeah. head to the U.S. We, we have, we've been saving you guys a lot for this first class. Uh, if you want to join us in Ackland, Pennsylvania, come on in. Go for it. Hi, I'm wondering, along with all of my uh, K-6ers, what is that bump on their back made of? Is it muscle? Is it bone? Is it both? Nice. Sorry, I just caught the last yeah, part no, of that. No problem, Mary Ellen. So they're asking about the big bump on their back. What's it made of? Is it muscle, bone, fat? Like, what is that composed of? Oh, the big bump on their back. Yeah, so that is their ske- skeleton underneath there. So that that's actually how their backbone is underneath. But then there's lots of muscle packed around it, as you can see right here. Yeah, there. Uh, that is uh, an incredibly close bison to you guys. That's awesome. Um, 
Cool shot, guys. All right. Um, let's head to some of our YouTube classes for a minute, and then we'll do a second round of questions with all our live classes. Um, so Amelia at Kruger Elementary in San Antonio, Texas, wants to know, how much can bison weigh? How much does a bison weigh? <laughs> um, females range anywhere from about 1,000 to 1,400 pounds, and cow uh, bulls can range between 14 and 2,000 pounds. Yeah. Awesome. So to give you guys an idea there as well, that's about the size of two grand pianos. <laughs> it's about the size of your whole class. If we have kids that are grade one through four, probably, if you get all the students in your class together, it'd make like one bison. So they're a big, heavy, heavy animal. I think they're the, are they the biggest animal in North America? One of the biggest animals in North America? Yes, this is the largest land mammal in North America. Very cool. All right. Uh, one thing that Rudy's talk talked about, uh, he mentioned uh, just in passing, and it's a question from Miss Passman's class, is a bison the same as a buffalo? Let's clear this up. <laughs> is he asking Rudy? Are you going to Rudy for that question or coming yeah, to Rudy for that question? Rudy, come on in. Yeah. Is a you mentioned buffalo for a second there. Can you explain the difference or, or the similarities or why, why there's the names of them both? No, it's a, it's a misnomer. In other words, I shouldn't say misnomer. It's incorrect. They should be even called bison all the time. Uh, we've called them buffalo. When I was a child, they called them buffalo, but it's really bison. And so we have, we actually have two different versions. We have sort of the plains bison, yep. which was the one which was the most common. And then we have the wood bison. So they're the same species in a scientific way, but a different subspecies. Yeah. But they're basically very closely related. And I think they will they will happily breed uh, together. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for clarifying that. It's something that we get a lot whenever we talk about bison and all our other programs with Parks Canada. So I appreciate that. All right, Mr. Rage Cloud, joining us in Oakville for the first time ever. And again, welcome into you guys. They're wondering what is threatening bison in the wild now and what their class can do to help. Well, one of the greatest things uh, affecting bison in the wild, unfortunately, is disease disease that the cattle brought over back in the settler days. Um, so what, what can we do to, to help them in the wild? There's many different things. There are a lot of conservation agencies that uh, could do some help um, in different ways. Um, and, and just understanding that these species, that this species is a very important uh, animal in Canada and the United States. Um, and just to keep them top of mind, when you're trying to reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, so just think sustainably for the future. Yep, that's a, a really nice message. And one that we get to share with all the students that we help protect. There are so many things you guys can do from home. No space is the central element of that. And if you want to learn more about conservation of species, check online. There's one of the a lot of great conservation resources. Um, and uh, there's a lot of other things you can find on a variety of amazing sites and amazing programs on the web. We've covered a lot of them here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. All right, I'm going to take two more questions from YouTube. Uh, so many pouring in. Thanks, guys, for all the support. And then we'll go back to Nahani Way School for another one from Miss Gill's class. So our question from Ms. Wu joining us in YouTube, do bison tails react like dog tails? Do they tuck in when they're stressed? I love that question. <laughs> um. That is an excellent question. Uh, I'm not sure that it's quite like a dog's tail. I don't know that they tuck it in, but they do use it a lot. It helps them fan off the, the bugs in the summertime. And it's definitely, they'll they'll flick it when when they're just kind of, um, another one's walking past them, but, but not as much. Let me say their tail doesn't have as much emotion as a dog's tail. So we're disappointed in the fact that we can't have a herd of bison with wagging tails running across a field because that would be truly amazing. So if, if that ever changes for them, if this, this patch is particularly enthusiastic, we'll check in again and hopefully get that uh, in a future broadcast. All right, Madeline has been joining us for so many programs over the last few months, and she's watched a lot of vet shows. She wants to know if you ever have to put your hands inside the bison to check if they're pregnant or do anything else with regards to reproduction. Uh, you guys talked about all the stuff you do. Is there any of that going on? Absolutely. Mad Madeline, you know a bit too much, but that's exactly how we do assisted reproduction in our bison. It's how we look for pregnancy. It's how we look if if they're, they're making embryos or the eggs are ready to make embryos. So you, you hit the nail on the head. We do the same with bison as you would with the domestic cow. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Gabby. All right, let's go back to Ms. Gill's class. Go back to our live groups. Ms. Gill, come on in. Give me your mic and you're good to go. 
Yes, Adam. Do you want to ask? Adam. How long are the horns grow? Yeah, how long do the horns grow, guys? I'm so sorry. I think it's we're having an issue with our audio when other classes come in. Would you be able to repeat that for us, Jesse? Yeah, that's okay. How long do their horns grow? How long? They probably get about a, a foot long on the adult. They start off with little small little ones, but they curve up. They have all different different unique curvatures. But usually they get about about a foot long is a is a maximum. Perfect. Thank you, guys. All right, Ms. Gail's class uh, joining us on YouTube now. They want to know the caribou in quarantine you mentioned. Does that mean that animals at the zoo can get COVID and things like that? Like what, what prompted them to be in quarantine? And can that happen to the bison? So what's the question, sir? Um, sorry, just give us one hit. I just have to repeat the question. I don't think these guys heard it. Take your time. Well, with the caribou, actually, every single year, we do what's called preventive medicine. So all our animals get vaccinated and they get their health checks. And it just happens that this week it was the caribou's turn. And so uh, sometimes even vets will come out from the university to give them a little once over. So um, so it's, it's kind of like they went for their annual health check this week. Yeah. All right. Guys, if you can check more that, we've got COVID questions for animals. It depends on the animals. Some animals are able to catch COVID. Typically, the more related animals are to one another, the more viruses they are able to share with one another. So we'd be able to share viruses with apes, monkeys, and mammals down the line, but a lot less likely with something like a snake or a fish. Um, so that's a, a pretty good general rule for being able to share viruses with other creatures. Um, I'm going to go to Miss Reynolds' class in just a second, but I love this question from Rachel. Um, she is a wildlife and biology grad from the University of Guelph, and she would love to get involved with the research you have going on there is there a way for a student out of school to come in and actually partner with you guys in any way or not there are many different ways a lot of the research that we do is with students from all levels we have college and university programs and of course a lot of our partnerships are with the university of toronto scarborough university of guelph and others so the best way you can either um check out our website you can try to find our emails and contact us we do get a lot of emails but of course, our human resources department is really excellent at funneling interest our way. Perfect. Um, thanks, Rachel, for that great question. You can email me uh, online. I'm going to share my email in the YouTube chat bar for you if you want to get in touch, and I'll hopefully make that a little faster for you. Um, Ms. Reynolds, uh, come on back in. Go for it. Go ahead. How large do they get? How large do they get? <laughs> so how large can they get again? They, um, female bison can range anywhere from about 1,000 to 13, 1,400 pounds, and males can reach between 1,400 to about 2,000, 2,100 pounds. Nice. I'm going to take a quick segue from this question uh, from Nazmin in Mrs. Harui's class. Uh, how much does a baby bison weigh? So when they come out and they're as cute as you showed us, how much do they weigh then? Uh, baby bison, they probably weigh about 50 pounds when they first come out of mom. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, all right, Miss Church's class from Elementary, come on back in. Do you mute that mic? And then we'll go to Miss Metternack to wrap up in a minute. Elena, can you turn on your mic and ask your question nice and loud? Why do they get so big? Why do they get so big? Why such monstrous bison? So why do the bison get so big? They're large. They're, they're large bovine. They're from the cattle, beef. You know, they they range in that wild herd, so they bulk on fats to keep them through the winter, and that's probably why they, they get so large because they are cattle. They are bovine, so they do grow one of the largest in the in North America, and that's why they get so heavy. Yeah. I think they just yeah they just evolved that way. They're big land herbivores. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the many different ways that they can make a living is just to be huge and eat a whole bunch of grass. So very cool question, guys. All right, let me go to Miss Metternach's class back in Calgary. Come on in. Go for it. Hi again. How many bones do they have? Could you repeat that for me? Sorry. How many bones do they have? Ooh, how many bones do they have? Okay, start counting, Gabby and Ken. 
<laughs> How many bones do they have? Oh no, that's a trick question. Not no, a you have to answer. You, if you have to answer today. I'm sorry, it's the rules. If a kid asks bone question, what do we think? I mean, people have like 206. Are we gonna say similar for bison? Much more? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I would probably uh, say a bit more, but in that range. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Put you on the spot for the day. Um, well, we got time for about a couple more questions. So I'm gonna take a few from YouTube really quick. Um, Miss, uh, or yeah, Miss Finuff wants to know what is the most difficult part of taking care of your bison at the zoo. That's a question for Ken here. Okay, the most difficult part is probably the seasonal conditions we have here. Uh, the animals are built for outside, but here at the, at, the, in, at the Toronto Zoo, we get a lot of rain and a lot of cold and snowy weather. So at that time, we have to make sure that the animals have adequate uh, feeding stations where we feed. Uh, Water-wise here, we have automatic waters for our animals here, but sometimes they, they freeze during the winter, so we have to bring in a secondary water. So it's probably our winter climates that's probably the hardest thing to deal with our wood bison right here because they, they're, they're more or less wild animals in a captive holding. So they're used to being out in the cold like they are, but we still, they're being captive animals. We make sure they have all the adequate that they need. So, yeah. Great question, guys, and thanks. All right, Ms. Uh, Tiverwall wants to know Clark Boulevard Public School. Which one is the oldest? What's your oldest bison? How old? Right now. Right now. The oldest bison we have now is 19. Okay. And again, we learned earlier how long they live, so a few more years, uh, but that's a, a older, older bison. Um, Ms. Wu wants to know, is there any baby bison we can see live? Do you have any baby bison on site or not? What are the young ones? Um, the, ba the babies, we have the six um, ones we got from Quebec and they range anywhere from uh, four years of age to six. But they yes. all, they're not they're not babies. We call them young peppers, young little cows. Yeah, so they don't look like the little cute 50 pounders that you have out there right now. So another day maybe. Okay. Um, Madeline wants to know, sort of one last question. I love this. Um, rhino horns, are rhino horns and pangolin scales, sorry, rhino horns and pangolin scales are made out of keratin, the same material our fingernails and hair are made of. Are bison horns the same or are they both? <laughs> That's a trick question. Are they, sorry, are they the same or are they what? Yeah, are they made of keratin or bone or what What comprises the bison horns? Uh, another excellent question. And, um, you, you've totally caught me. These are my favorite animals, and I'm not sure I know that. But, um, yeah, I'm going to have to defer on that one. Yeah, I'm looking it up really quick to see if there's a, a quick answer to that online. Uh, but, 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 let's see. But very astute. So one quick note on that question. Uh, note, a lot of things that are on animals are made of keratin. So rhino horn is a classic example. People poach rhino for their horn, and the horn is literally made of the same thing that your fingernails are made of. So they're not worth... Um, uh, you know, not worth taking off. It's the same material you're figuring out. Bison horn, the outer horn on a bison is made of keratin as well, and the inner part is bone. So when you get bison, you'll have a little bit of a bone knob with some keratin on top of it. So it's a bit of both. So great question, Madeline. And see, we're, we're stumping Gabby all over the place here. This is half the fun of programs, is that sometimes it's hard to, you know, get all these answers uh, really readily in about 40 minutes. So I appreciate the great questions, guys. The one thing I want to do now, uh, just to bring up for everyone, torontozoo.com, amazing resources there, particularly the Zoo to You programs. They've done all sorts of stuff to, to go digital and bring you guys some amazing educational resources. So I really encourage all our classes to check that out over the, the days and weeks to come. And you, of course, you can check out all our amazing programs at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Just type in Toronto Zoo on our YouTube channel. You'll see all our past programs, including the Lemur one uh, in conjunction with the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. So with that, um, Thank you so, so much, Mary Ellen, Ken, Gabby, Rudy. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciated hearing all these amazing stories from you guys. And as you know, uh, for those of you who have joined us before, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our teachers. So Miss Gill, Miss Church, Miss Reynolds, and Miss Metternach, if you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you and goodbye to the zoo team, you are all in the broadcast. Go